in the movies when someone's being sneaky they say don't make a sound um but uh with the risk of complementing your acoustical foam absorbent walls with tinfoil it's important to know that one of the most effective ways to hack into a computer these days is actually by making a sound uh, according to reports from several sources um, victims have been uh, targeted by hackers using malicious code woven into ordinary audio wave files uh, for espionage operations and good old-fashioned you know monetary gain um, whatever the reason it should be a, of no surprise of course since any file involving data will have no you know problem containing other media in it even if it's not of the same medium uh, stenography being a prime example of that but using sound for clandestine operations is as ancient as the tools themselves from the drum uh, originally being used for communicating uh, over further distances uh, than the voice could carry or the eye could see um, to the ghost uh, army in World War II using turntables to play back sound effects to deflect the enemy uh, to Leon Theremin inventing the bug you know the source of inspiration of practically every invention we use for music has roots in espionage and uh, the act of communicating secrets through sound being used for inception uh, we can better understand and develop beyond what music was determined to be and from that trip through the darkness we can come out with a profound illumination around what it is for an artist to gain power over their ideas or even whether we should at all when we talk about these formats we're speaking about them as containers vessels of distribution for our work uh, and like trains once were for graffiti artists in the 70s and 80s uh, prior to the implementation of the buff which was a form of removing uh, spray paint from the surface of trains and it eventually actually eradicated train graffiti uh, completely uh, the containers for which we allow our sounds to travel through can be vandalized you know they're a blank white wall waiting to be written on yet all we do is write a title on the file and fill it with audio and music you know metadata and pray for the best right but as these hackers have proven we can do so much more you know we could fill it with more information ideas what have you th that is found by the audience for example as a reward for purchasing or for searching for it at all uh, we could also use these tactics used by these hackers to track our work or find any apparent copying of it taking place once we become unbound from the narrative uh, that music's purpose is solely for entertainment and we focus uh, on it as a tool for communication most of the issues surrounding economics politics and ownership become less shrouded in uh, mystery right uh, giving artists an aspect of power that they were previously unaware of so with just the slightest bit of creative thinking we can use the same tactics used by these waveform hijackers to gain control over our work and establish additional value to it so I mean, am I recommending that music productions also pose as containers for malicious code? No, but uh, it's an example of utilizing every bit of what our music is contained in, as well as a tool that we, in fact, can claim ownership of, or at least discuss ownership at all, right? So, uh, like, around a decade ago, I was teaching at UCSD, I came across uh, Covert Acoustical Mesh Networks. It's a decentralized communication system that transmits data by using sound to connect computers. The proposition of covertly targeting a computer using speakers and microphones commonly available for the use of entertainment, video, conferencing, or IP phone communication speakers and microphones, or the sound system are the least considered when it comes to an attack. Yet, has been for many centuries exactly the means for which some of the greatest ideas for infiltrations used, right? So, from today's use of sonic weapons, such as LRADs, ultrasound, uh, or the history of Hitler's specialized Neumann microphone, uh, which was used to project his voice for the ultimate experience, something that today seems to be forgotten, mostly left out of, uh, you know, discussion in most academic institutions. But uh, stealthy communication can be implemented in acoustical networks by utilizing inaudible frequencies, uh, the ultrasonic or near-ultrasonic frequency range. And uh, it was originally used for underwater communication systems. And the idea of this form of attack came from presenting what's called uh, proof of concept trials, POC, 
for acoustical infections as a method of communication among air gap computer systems. And air gapping uh, is a form of securing sensitive data from any hacking possible. And it revealed this very obvious but not yet noticed loophole. So while any laptop lets you turn off, you know, basic uh, radio connections like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the most effective way to air gap a computer was to just physically remove all the hardware uh, that had to do with that, right? That allowed access or to use a computer that did not come with any hardware included at all such as uh, Intel NUC or uh, Gigabyte bricks, but not many had removed the speakers or microphones, so leaving them open to an attack from an acoustic mesh network. And uh, although an additional tool was needed on the computer itself, this completely blew my mind. Like these forms of, a, of a mesh networks commonly used a partial mesh network in order to conduct the transmission through the fastest points rather than by connecting all endpoints using ultrasonic frequencies to stealthily send data without any internet connection whatsoever. And a, a security researcher uh, discovered a stealth infection called Bad BIOS. And it was one of the first malware suspected of utilizing acoustic uh, mesh networks. And they claimed that the malware infected firmware communicated with the machines and compromised uh, neighboring computers through sound. And uh, although during the time the discovery was speculated as like being unproven, POC trials have demonstrated that the power of acoustical uh, infections in the field is real and that malware can in fact infect, you know, systems through acoustical channels. It's wise to learn any and all methods of using the capsules that we deliver our media in, of which there are many. So crypto jacking waveform gangsters being no exception, you know, Hackers find out if a system is flawed, right? So while electronic musicians seem to be less aware of this function of their abilities, mostly because this is rarely taught or spoken about. Uh, a good example is Marconi, a central figure in the modern understanding of communication and the idea of globally networked wireless communications who improved upon wireless Morse code by developing a more practical method uh, using radio waves. However, as with uh, most innovators, he was intercepted by a British inventor and a, magi a magician, not a musician, a magician <laughs> uh, and manager of the Anglo-American Telegraph uh, Company, Neville Maskell, whom in, uh, he in uh, 1903 vandalized a presentation of Marconi's invention by intercepting a Morse code message meant to play to an audience during a presentation. And Maskelin used a uh, 50 meter radio mass and in interrupted Marconi's message with a barrage of insults in order to show that it was flawed, making it possibly one of the first known examples of uh, gray hat hacking. And uh, not to mention a classic case of, you know, corporate espionage. Maskelin's approach was to disavow the idea that Marconi had a chance whatsoever in creating a secure connection. In other words, Maskelin wanted to remove any hope in security. So in a lot of ways, he was both right and wrong in that we did eventually use Marconi's inventions, yet also have been constantly proven that security will always be an issue. You know, there is something pleasurable in having this kind of power, putting into perspective what has changed of our connection to our media um, or to our possessions for that matter. And how many musicians have been driven away from having this kind of power? something to think about. And yet here it is, clear as day, you're working with digital media, do more with it. Set up security so that we can get back to a point of economic wealth or eradicate wealth completely, if that's what you're into. We should try to take comfort in the fact that what they are doing is in many ways exactly what musicians and producers should be doing with their audio files. Except perhaps without all the, you know, sexy legal activity. Um, you know, we should probably retain power over our audio if it's the container for the music that we own. Uh, yet here we have true to life waveform hustlers, you know, using audio files for more than just another upload into the ether, right? How many musicians go that extra mile to fill up the very vessel that carries their music from one place to another with some extra bits to state who is the owner of it? It's hard to know whether we own anything that's digital at all, you know, as audiophiles, whether they be AIF, FLAC, WAVE, or MP3s, like vinyl or CDs, are simply containers, delivery systems for our work to be distributed. Um, the physicality of the object, though, determines whether we feel emotionally that something is in fact our property. 
And depending on its availability, when we lose an audio file, we typically have another copy somewhere that can be easily found with a quick search in a matter of seconds. But everything that represents real ownership is based around secrecy. So as our property must be kept secure for it to be truly owned by us, um, we ourselves are becoming basically advert to the very idea of ownership while still needing to own our property. I hope that this opens up a dialogue about ownership and how clever it is that we have slowly lost all possessions by the use of digital media. When we purchase music digitally, we on one hand are entitled to own it, and on the other are pretty clear in the knowledge that we do not. When discussing the alchemy behind the success of his Apple computers, Steve Jobs once said, I believe that the spirit that causes people to want to be poets instead of bankers can be put into products, and those products can be manufactured and given to people, and they can sense that spirit. And what Jobs wanted to do was to give that indescribable feeling one got when opening a vinyl record, which was at the root, you know, of his use of the Apple logo, which he stole from the Beatles, by the way. Uh, and that's even more proof to what I'm arguing over ownership and the convergence of these elements is the lawsuit which came about between Jobs and the Beatles' own corporation, um, Apple Corps. And this is really interesting. In uh, 2003, a revisiting of the litigation which had begun decades before between Apple Computers and Apple Corps, a company owned by the Beatles and their families, was renewed upon the creation of iTunes, right? So in 1989, let's go back, in 1989, Apple Computers and Apple Corps settled their dispute over the ownership of the name Apple, where Apple Corps agreed to allow Apple Computers to use the name Apple and its logo, as long as Apple computers remained outside of the music industry, which was clearly violated, right? As soon as Apple computers launched iTunes. Which not only breached the agreement of staying out of the music industry, but in fact, they took it over, right? So Jobs' approach was to simply do something he agreed not to do and to then pretend that it was never a problem to begin with and then to deal with the aftermath with the weapons he accumulated from his innovations, namely wealth using time that he could buy through lawyering up a privilege afforded to him by the act of innovating within a copy of a copy of a copy.